Okay, recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class on 309 Urban Church Planting. This week we have only one lecture because uh, yesterday was a holiday here. It was our uh, Indian Independence Day, so we didn't have class. Uh, so let's uh, just take a moment to pray. May I ask somebody to pray with the class and then we will get started. Anybody wants to pray? You can just go ahead. Would like to pray? I'll pray, sir. Go ahead, Mandy. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for bringing us the safe, Lord, so see. May partake on this uh, lesson, Lord, you're teaching us, Lord. Mm-hmm. And we pray, Father, that you, Holy Spirit, will empower us to open our hearts so that whatever we get fed today, Jesus, may remain in our hearts, may brood in us, Lord, so that it's prayer food. And that whenever we find ourselves in this situation, we have to use this knowledge, Lord. That we be fruitful and your kingdom, your word will be full advent. Empower Pastor Shis as he teaches. Ah, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Um, welcome once again, everyone, to this class. So, this course on urban church planting, as we said, we uh, are going to be focusing on church planting specifically, but uh, the things that we talk about could be applied to starting any kind of ministry in an urban context. So uh, even if it's not a church, if you're planning to start some other kind of ministry, uh, it would you can still use these things, uh, insights that we are going to learn. Plus, the same things can apply to a non-urban context. So even if it's a smaller town or even a village or some other context where you're planning to start a ministry, many of these things that we talk about uh, will, uh, you know, can easily be transferred and applied in other contexts. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share the lecture notes, which all of you already have, and then we will move forward from where we paused last week. So we had, to, uh, we had spoken about you know, getting God's heart for the city, uh, why it's important, how you know, we need uh, to feel what God feels, see what God sees uh, for the city, and God would impart his strategies, his thoughts, um, uh, his heart, his compassion for the city. And it's very important so that we are not discouraged by the things we see happen in our city, that we feel the heart of God, especially for the people in our city, uh, even though you know, there may be things in our city that, you know, that are making life difficult and uh, all of that you know, that's happening. In spite of all of that, we still stay close to the heart of God for our city, and come from that place as we do ministry. Now we're going to kind of get start getting into the the practical more and more as we progress. um, We're going to get into more of the practical side of uh, church planting. And so I want to talk about it here in chapter five to take some time to understand the natural dynamic of urban centers or the city in which we are going to work. Right? So it's important for us to get a good understanding of what is happening in both the natural and spiritual. So we'll talk first about the natural and we'll talk about the spiritual. Of what is happening over the city, the urban center. Right? But to get it started today, you know, maybe we could just open up for a little discussion here on how is a city different from a village? Just some quick thoughts here. 
uh, you know, uh, any, anything that you want to share. How is a city different from a village? Anybody? How is an urban center different from a rural village type setting? Anything? Just run, just feel free to share your thoughts. Uh, we can say, Pastor, that uh, cities, the infrastructure, the the is better, and there are more amenities. Uh, it is mm. equipped for people to be, you know, uh, getting better um, provisions for medical education. They're better than villages in terms mm -hmm. of atmosphere, in terms of uh, uh, you know pollution and all. We can say villages are better. Uh, but cities are more polluted, they're more uh, time consuming, traveling and everything, uh, villages, uh, you know, people uh, have more time and better air to breathe. Mm -hmm. so this is what is coming to my mind right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one, one thing, right? In cities, the infrastructure is there, a lot of uh, access to a lot of things are there. But at the same time, there are downsides, like uh, I've been responding out pollution and so on. Uh, I see Rupa uh, sharing about being literate. So usually in people in cities are more literate. They have the opportunity to study, advance learning, information, so on. That is true. Charles, go ahead. Go ahead, Charles. I think you raised your hand. How are cities and villages different? Okay. Anyone else? More populated, sir. Yeah. So cities are densely populated. You know, usually you've got you know millions of people all living in a in a, in a not a very wide area, uh, whereas villages, you know, are very sparsely populated mostly. Yeah, the people are distributed, you know, little groups of people here and there, whereas cities are very uh, uh, densely populated. I see our city is developed, villages full of that animals not developed. Yeah, so so the whole development, you know, cities are highly developed in contrast to uh, villages, and villages, the, li the life is very different. What about the pace of change? When you look at the city and the village, so we recognize cities are changing rapidly. Right, a village, you know, you visit a village after ten years, and maybe few things have changed. You don't find any drastic changes. You know, after ten years, fifteen years, life hasn't changed very much, generally speaking. Whereas in the city. The city changes rapidly, you know, almost year after year, you see so many things changing, not only the infrastructure, but the demographic distribution, the problems of the city, the size of the city, um, you know, the good and the bad, everything is just, just rapidly changing uh, in the life of the city. So the city is, is, is almost like, if you want to say, it's a moving target, meaning, uh, you know, the way the city is keeps on changing. The dynamic within the city is changing at a much faster pace than the way things, uh, the life in the village. The life in the village is almost static. You know, after decades, you would hardly find much change. Let's look at some of what is Harrison is saying. Cities are busy and chaos, so villages are peaceful and quiet. Yeah, life in the city busy, out of tension, people are, you know, uh, for good reasons and bad reasons, people are very, you know, occupied, preoccupied. In the village, life is so peaceful, quiet, slow, so on, right? So just, just for us to think, you yeah, know, that cities are complex, uh, cities are dynamic, uh, and, and so when we are doing ministry in the city, our mindset also must be accommodating to the changes that are happening around us in the city. And we must be aware. We must uh, be able to respond to the things. Whereas if we are doing ministry in a village setting, 
things are moving and changing you know, at a much slower pace. The challenges there are quite different. Just to get us to think on those lines. Let's go back to our notes here. Um, so when we talk about the natural dynamics of a city, here are some of the things we would be interested in looking at. It's been interesting in looking at the history of the city. You know, when was it established? Under what circumstances was it established? What was the motivation behind it? We would, of course, look at the administration, the government, the civic and the political environment prevailing. We look at the economy. Uh, we look at the demographics, which is the age distribution of the population, what are the languages, cultural backgrounds, and you know, senior citizens, young people. Good take time to understand the socioeconomic issues that our people in the city face or deal with. They look at the education in the city, you know, of, uh, of what, what is the level of education, what are things people are pursuing, what are the interests, of where are the educational institutions distributed in the city, um, what are the industries, where are the indus industries located, how are women treated? Are, are women engaged much in the workplace? What about unemployment? What about you know the disabled population? What about the prison system? Other things like accidents and so on. All of these things, um, poverty, so on. A lot of these issues. So when we look at a city, we uh, and we talk about the natural dynamics of the city. These are the kind of things we need to be aware of. So when you are thinking of, you know, planting a church or starting a ministry in a city, it is good to do our homework. Try to take some time to understand, talk to people about it. Now, you know, uh, these days, uh, a lot of information is available online. So you can go online and actually uh, literally explore a city, you know, through Google Maps, you can do a full survey of the, an aerial survey of the city, you can find out you know, where are the institutions, so on and so forth, what's happening, you can read content online uh, to get to understand more about the city. And so, so things are much easier. I remember you know, 20 years ago when we uh, were, were, were planning to start APC, we didn't have these kinds of things. You know? uh, and so uh, I actually wrote letters to some pastors in the city, they asking them, you know, uh, which would be the good area in the city where I should think of starting a church. So I was depending more on you know, what people would say uh, to kind of understand what, it, what was going on in Bangalore City because I had been away for quite some time and lost touch. And so I, I reached out to the pastor to kind of get some information. But today, you know, uh, a lot of this information is available online. It's easy to you know, look at a city through Google Maps or through other sources and get a good understanding. So it is very useful to do a study on understanding the natural dynamics of a city. And the 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 appendix in in this in these notes, um, uh, we've had a, we have a little um, uh, uh, documentation of the natural dynamics of Bangalore City. You know some other things. And of course, it's always changing, right? Now, the question we want to ask is, why would, why is it important to understand the natural dynamics of the city when we are planning to do a church plant or start a ministry? Why is that important? Of course, you know, uh, I put some sort of reasons here, but uh, I just like to hear from you. Now, why would it be important to do a homework? You know that. Uh, to get a good idea of what's going on in the city. Why is that important? How would it benefit the us? Go ahead, Tom. Um, the natural dynamics helps the planner to, to know the, the catchment area, the, the people that will be coming to, your, to, to the church in case you begin. Then you also uh, plan, uh, for instance, now if you are in the village setting, then you will know uh, which methods of worship you are going to use, 
Are you going to use machines? Are the people going to clap hands? Mm. Or they are going to use the, the local local musical system like drums, like shakers and all that, the guitar. If it is a town, so you will find that you you first know the catchment area, you know, you plan on the worship, you plan on um, and the people that you are going to use, uh, if the people are going to have salary, maybe you, you are likely to employ some people like in administration. Uh, but when it is a village, you might find that you are not going to put administrators, but you are going mm. to have majorly volunteers and people who are not really skilled to that level. And in town, you might have skilled ones that have even studied to the level that you need. That's my mm -hmm. input. Thank you. Yeah. So you've you know you you've, you've pointed out a lot of lot of things, Charles. Thank you. So if we if we if we you know study the city, uh, you know we will know where are you know where we should start the kind of church that we want to start, uh, depending on whom we are planning to reach. Uh, it will also tell us, you know, how to relate to those people in terms of uh, the, the style of worship, the, the kind of ministry we do. It will also show us what resources we have access to, right? Uh, do the, are those people already, you know, qualified? So uh, Charles pointed out many different things there. All very good, very good. I see uh, Rupa's comment in the chat. It helps us better prepare to reach the people. Good. Any other reason, any other things you can think of? Why should we try to understand the natural dynamics of the city as part of our preparation for church plant or doing starting a ministry? Any other thoughts? Yeah. So I think um Kung Bilu's um, comment there, we must be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, so we can make wise decisions. As we plan to, uh, you know, to engage the city, uh, Rupa says to be focused and fruitful. Very good. Elisha says it informs their entire entry strategy. Very good. Good ideas and good thoughts. Any, anything else? Anybody wants to share? Good. So uh, all of these things are very valid, right? Uh, Abraham says it helps to understand the heart of the people. Yeah. Good. So when we when we take some time to study the city, it really helps us in many ways. Right? First of all, uh, as a minister, uh, uh, you know, you have a calling. All of us, you know, we have a calling, and you may feel called to a certain kind of people. Let's say, example, you're called. You feel like God is God wants you to reach the young people, the youth, or you feel God wants you to focus on married couples and families. Somebody else may say, you know, I feel God wants me to focus on children, whatever. You know, they, each one of us may have a, a specific calling and gifting in a certain area. It's very important to know where those people are, right? For example, if you feel like, you, you know, you, you got a call to reach uh, um, the professionals, the working profession, and if you go and start a planted church in an area where there are retired people or you know elderly people who are you know they finish their work, work and they're retired you go start a church there you know you're wondering why are, why aren't the professionals coming well because you've started in the place where it's difficult for them to reach the people all around in the neighborhood are people you know who are retired and so on and so there's a disconnect uh, so what would you want to do you'd want to plant the church you want to start your ministry as close to your target audience as possible you know so it is us doing our homework being just you know being one is in how we go about doing what god has called us to do so you find where are the working professionals where are they generally populated you know can how can i be as close to them as possible or at least they should you know the church should be accessible the ministry should be accessible there should be an interface happening same thing you're doing for young people or college students. Go where the colleges are, or at least a few colleges are, you know. Uh, and then accessibility uh, is very important. So things like that. And then, you know, what are the needs of the people? 
right? So when you are ministering, you are actually going to connect with them by first addressing some practical needs of the people. So when you study the city, you'll begin to understand, you know, hey, maybe there's a high suicide rate in the city, so I mean, that's a big problem. Or maybe um, there are a lot of uh, people, uh, uh, you know, without job, uh, for, you know, jobless. Maybe that's a need I can talk about and address. So doing your homework really helps us, you know, um, together with God and together with the Holy Spirit, with the wisdom of God, we approach the city very meaningfully, very purposefully, depending on what God has called you to do. Of course, you're not going to solve all the problems of the city, and that shouldn't be our goal. We're not here to address every problem the city faces. But based on God's call on your life, based on what he has put on your life, you need to position yourself the best you can to serve people in the city. The Apostle Paul, you know, when he went to Athens, and I'm, I'm referencing Acts chapter 17, when he went to Athens, he took time to understand, to talk to the people in the city. So if you have your Bible, and I, and I, and I know I'm going a little off the notes here, but uh, if we have a Bible, let me also open my Bible. Uh, so Acts chapter 17, and I'll just point out those verses that I uh, that I'm just referencing. If somebody could read that, to go with me to Acts chapter 17, uh, and uh, so he comes to Athens, and in Acts chapter 17, um, let's let me find those verses here. Uh, let's look at verses. Uh, 16, Acts 17, verses 16 and 17. Acts, the 17th chapter, verses 16 and 17. Can somebody read that for us, please? Acts 16, Acts chapter 17, verse 16 and 17. Acts 17. Go ahead. Please do. Please, Maggie, read. Thanks, thanks for me. Uh, now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Paul had come to Athens and uh, he was waiting for, you know, Silas and Timothy to come and join him. So he was waiting for other members of his team. Now, while he was at Athens, he was kind of, you know, the first initial period of his time in Athens, this is a new city for Paul. What did he do? Uh, verses 16 and 17 kind of is giving us an idea that Paul was just trying to understand the city and the people in the city. It says here that he saw that this verse 16, he saw that the city was given over to idols, verse 16. Now, how, how did that happen? I mean, you can just imagine in your mind, Paul must have toured around the city, you know, just going around, going, you know, walking around, just, you know, we would say like, he's just exploring the city. And he is not saying, hey, the city is full of idols. So Paul wasn't, you know, sitting in a little corner and, uh, you know, no, he was going around the city and he began to realize this city is given to idols. People are worshiping. And, and, and he would see later on that as he is given an opportunity to speak to the Aeropagus, which is the, 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 the elect group of uh, people in the city, he tells them, men and brethren, I have noticed that you have an idol for every god. And there is also an idol to the unknown god. And then he uses that as a basis to start talking to them about the true and living god. So he kind of understood the city. The other thing you see in verse 17 is he's talking to the people. Right? So he goes to the synagogue and he's reasoning with the Jews and Gentile worshippers. So he's engaging his reasoning. That means that there's a dialogue going on. He's uh, listening to their questions. He's responding to their questions in the synagogue. And not only in the synagogue, but it says in verse 17, even in the marketplace. So in the marketplace, here are the, all the people 
the traders, the people who come, they're coming to buy and sell, they're coming to do business. And obviously, uh, you know, in between those, uh, those things, they're just standing and having conversation, they're talking. So he goes to the marketplace, he's, he's engaging with the people, and he's, he's kind of getting a feel, he's getting an understanding of what Athens is all about. What are these people thinking? What are these people, you know, what do they believe? In? What do they worship? You know, so those, those two verses are just beautiful. They kind of show us that Paul is taking time. He's come to Athens. It's a new city. Of course, he's anointed by God. He is uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's the, the apostle. Uh, and uh, he's come to, you know, advance God's kingdom. But you also see him taking the time to do this natural work, this practical work of understanding the city and understand the people who are living in the city. And I think that's a beautiful example and that kind of leads into how he's able to speak uh, to the leaders of the city. And eventually um, there are some key people uh, who accept and receive uh, the gospel that Paul preaches to them uh, at Mars Hill, right? So uh, let me just go back to the notes here. Uh, so I want to impress on our hearts that uh, we need to, you know, take time to understand the city. You know, uh, and as you do your little, uh, as we do our research, it gives us a feel for the city. Uh, we can pray for the city. We can develop a heart of compassion toward the city. Uh, God will place specific areas and needs in the heart of the city. He will also uh, help us develop strategies to minister to the city. And you know what you can do, what you should not do, what you should avoid and so on. And I was let me just share a few uh, stories here. You know, way back in, um, uh, I think this was 2002, 2002. Uh, this was the year after 9-11 happened and, you know, and this is, anyway, I don't want to go into all the history there. But uh, in 2002, we, uh, we just, you know, made an, I just, I'm just giving one example of where an, uh, an exploratory trip did not materialize into something, and another example where an exploratory trip materialized in the planting of a church. So I'll give both examples. So in 2002, we made a trip to Kabul in Afghanistan. So I went along with another person from our, from our church at that time. We were a very small church, but we said, you know, hey, let's go. Let's go to Kabul. Let's see if we can do anything there. And at those days, I was running my technology business, the software company. So uh, we could use that as a our initial thought was to be able to use that uh, as a means to set up something in Kabul and then, you know, of course, to share Jesus with the people. Uh, so we went for we went on an exploratory trip, and when we went into Kabul, we spent three or four days there. Uh, I forget exactly all the details, but uh, we spent three, four days there um, going around the city. We saw, you know, uh, the city was greatly damaged because of all the fighting that had happened. Um, uh, and our goal was, okay, can we use technology as a means to come into the city at that time? Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we explored, we went around, talking to people, so on. Uh, and those days, there was only like one internet cafe in the whole city. Um, and there was hardly anything going on in terms of technology, infrastructure, and so on. So we came back, you know, uh, saying that, look, it's going to be too difficult and also too risky at that time because of all the tensions that were happening uh, to set up anything and then try to uh, do anything. So we explored, but it did not materialize in something uh, that we could do to plant, uh, to start a work. But on the other hand, that same year, 2002, we did an exploratory trip to a small town called Tarlakata, um, which is about 350 kilometers from where Bangalore city is. It was, it was near a, 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 another city called Manglo. So somebody had told us about this place called Tarlakata. And they said, hey, uh, that's, a, that's a town that's about on the outskirts of another city. Um, there are colleges coming up there, medical colleges mainly. Uh, students are going there to study. 
but there's nothing happening there. Uh, so that's a great place to plant a church. So we went there, and this time uh, I think there were four of us who had gone, uh, and uh, we had no contact there. You know, we just got somebody had told us that this is an opportunity, a place where we could start a work. We had no contacts. We, it was like, okay, just going, let's explore. So we, you know, we went and we looked in and out of these campuses. They're just, it was just a small town. There were just these uh, few medical colleges, nothing. So we were just praying, God, how do we do this? Or, you know, we saw the college campuses. We saw that students were coming from many different places to study there. Great opportunity, uh, but nothing much in that town. And that, that day, as we were walking up, in the thing, we came to uh, uh, like the, the small town center. You know, not much happening, but just like, and we looked up and we saw there was a a, a small place uh, on the first floor of a building where they would show, they would play videos, movies. So there, it was not like a proper movie theater. There's just a small hall where this man would play videos like uh, like a movie, and people would come and watch. Uh, so we just went up there, and uh, we asked them, you know, hey, uh, what time do you do your movies on Sunday? So Sundays, uh, and I think he said 12.30 or 1 o'clock or something. He gave us his timing. Then we said, can we rent this hall? And this hall is a small hall. Only, you could see it only 50 people. So can we rent your hall for two hours before your first movie show? Yeah, and we will pay you the money for it if you And he was more than happy. We told them it's for a church. You know, we want to have a church service here. We want to rent it for two hours every Sunday uh, before you show your first movie. And he was more than happy to do rent it out for us. And then we also asked them. We said, look, uh, next, you know, like in two Saturdays from now, can we rent it on a Saturday also? We want to do a music concert. Uh, and it was a small hall. Uh, he was fine with that also. You know, so because there's nothing happening in that song. But uh, so he was fine with that. So we planned, okay, in two weeks we'll go, we'll do a music concert, which was basically one person playing the guitar and singing some songs. Uh, we'll, you know, so we went a day before that, we stuck posters all around the town saying there's going to be a music concert in this place. Uh, and uh, and I remember this was almost 20 years ago, 2002, I'm talking about. And, um, and you know, uh, so we, we stuck posters and uh, about, uh, I forget the exact numbers, but at least 25 odd, or more people showed up for that music concert. There is one of us playing the guitar and singing songs. And uh, they came, then we invited them back for Sunday service, and some people showed up for the service. And that's how we actually started a church plant in that place called the Rathata. And uh, some amazing testimonies happened. You know, and so every, every weekend, we would send somebody from Bangalore they would take the bus, overnight bus, they would get to Delicata, they'd do the service, and they would head back to Bangalore. That's kind of how we started the service services over there. And because we were a small church in Bangalore, and we couldn't appoint a full-time pastor there at that time. So that's how the church started. Eventually, uh, you know, uh, one couple, they, they, they took up a job as, you know, the person, the man was a doctor, so he took up a job as a doctor, and he began to lead the church. He took a job as a doctor and a lecturer in one of those hospitals, and he began to lead the church there in the Lakata, and the work grew. There were at one point like 45 students who had, you know, many of them had given their lives to Christ, and so the work was growing, and it was just an amazing thing. And that eventually became what today is APC Mangalore. That means our church plant in the city of Mangalore, which you know, has grown, and, and over the years, many, many lives have been touched. And uh, today we have... Uh, you know, a full-time pastor, and John Paul and his wife are there. And over the years, you have different people pastoring the church and, and so on. But what I want to share is that, you know, we did an exploratory trip. Those days, we didn't have the tools and technologies we have today. So we had to physically go scout the city, see what's going on there, see what opportunities could be there to start a work. In one place, nothing happened, Kabul. In another place, on one trip, a door just swung open, which then, you know, eventually, you know, enable, um, enable us to plant a church, and you know that continued over the years uh, into a church that has blessed the lives of many students and many people 
uh, over the years. So uh, just just some thought there on you know, getting to understand the uh, dynamics of the city. So like I mentioned, at, toward the end of the notes, uh, there's a sample on how you can study the city uh, uh, in terms of you know, understanding what's going on in the city. Now, what I want to say is that because the city is dynamic, that means things in the city are constantly changing. We have to keep a constant view of what is going on in the city. And things are changing very fast. So today, for example, in Bangalore City, there are many things we cannot do today, which we could do, say, 20 years ago. And today, because of the political situation and other things, uh, uh, people are a little bit more antagonistic towards the public preaching of the gospel and so on in our city. But you know, 20 years ago, and I remember as a, as a 30, 40 years ago, as a, as a teenager, I would stand in street corners and go on. Even 10 years, ago, uh, let's say. Uh, yeah, 20 years ago, we had teams going around the city, you know, giving out tracts, and just, there was just a little bit more freedom for us to evangelize and so on. Today, things are more restrictive. Uh, there's a little, there's more pushback towards the church, towards evangelistic efforts. In the same city, the city has changed. So we should look at new ways on reaching people. But there's this whole world of uh, the whole digital space. The, the, the digital world has become a mission field in the city. So while certain ways of evangelism have closed down, other ways of evangelism have opened up in the city. So especially the digital world. So we can reach people, in fact, millions of people, if we leverage uh, what is available to us in the digital world to reach people in the city. Right? So things are constantly changing and how we engage people in the city also keeps changing. The message is the same, it's the gospel of Jesus, but how we evangelize, how we reach out, the needs that we are looking at addressing will be, be dynamic because the city is changing and and uh, very often it's changing very, very fast. And so we have to keep uh, uh, a constant, be in touch with what's going on in the city and keep adapting uh, our strategies towards um, what's going on in the city. Uh, are you all with me so far? Uh, any, any thoughts, any questions? All good? Okay. So, um, Christopher, go ahead. Yeah, Pastor, you had mentioned about, um, uh, you know, schools and education institutions um, as, as a, you know, um, a sort of a ca an area, uh, a catchment area for, you know, um, having people attend a, you know, a new church. Um, is that is that is that, is our education institutions um, like a sweet spot for uh, for that uh, for this um, you know for, for a, a sweet spot as a source for you know for people to to come and attend churches? Would you say that is uh, are, are there any other other sort of uh, uh, you know uh, um, sort of groups of people of uh, of people that uh, that could potentially also be a source? Yeah. So, okay, good, good question. Uh, let me say this, like what we have seen, say even in our own city in Bangalore, things have changed a lot, even in, in the educational side. So uh, I will answer your question in two parts. So one is, uh, you know, let's say five years ago, entry into educational institutions uh, to bring the gospel in, was much easier. So we ourselves as a church, we had multiple outreaches into schools and colleges. We had uh, what we were, you know, what Pastor Selena leads, Catalyst, and then we had uh, what we were referring to as campus elevatedness into colleges. We would go in and conduct one-hour programs and so on. So this was easy 
we had easy access. We would tap into schools. And the third aspect was the counseling. So we could take Chrysalis counseling into schools and do workshops and so on. So five years ago, schools, colleges were very open. Uh, and uh, at one point, on a weekly basis, we were speaking to about 25,000 students. Plus, we were speak on a monthly basis, we were speaking to close to 3,000 college students, uh, you know, bringing God's word to them. This was, you know, I'm talking about uh, uh, at least be prior to three years ago. But then what has happened is, the whole political situation has changed in, our, in Bangalore City. So now when we have approached schools and colleges, things are more difficult. Uh, in fact, we have not yet resumed our outreaches in colleges. That's still, you know, we haven't, colleges are not willing to let us come in to speak to their students. So, we should, so that's, almost zero now, uh, other than, I think, one college. And schools, again, has come down drastically. So things have changed because of the political situation. And so at one point, it was definitely a great place to reach out. Today, things are a little bit more difficult. But we are continuing to look at ways, how can we, you know, share, bring the word of God to schools and colleges. And we should continue looking at it, you know, and, and, and very intelligently see, seek to gain access to them. Uh, the other areas that I would, so the second answer, part of the answer is there are other areas that we should look at and we have looked at is one is Christian professionals. So especially in IT parks, in, in those, um, in those special zones where there are a lot of tech parks and businesses there. Um, and what, is, what has helped a lot in the past is to start um, prayer groups for professionals outside of office hours and also outside of um, the, uh, the office space. Many times we cannot do it inside the office space. We won't get permission. And also we cannot take away work time. So either it should be the lunch break or in the hours before the work, uh, work day starts or at the end of the work day. So uh, pro, uh, you know, profess, Christian professional groups or just prayer groups among the professionals was a good thing in the past. It was, you know, we could do that. Uh, now post pandemic, uh, um, we are still looking at resuming, so it hasn't started back up, but that's another area we're looking at. Uh, so a third area would be to address the felt need. So that's where Chrysalis Counseling comes in, where we do parenting workshops, marriage workshops, and uh, that also is a way to connect or interface with people in the city by addressing their needs. You know, everybody, every uh, family, whether matter, Christian or non-Christian, and would people, you know, people would like to learn about parenting. People would like to learn about, you know, marriage. How do I work marriage out, so on. And so that becomes another area um, where, in the past, this has been a very good way to interface with uh, people in the city. So uh, schools, professionals, the felt needs of the people. Right. Now, what I know other ministries are doing in the city are, you know, addressing specialized needs, for example, uh, drug addiction. So we have, uh, so we don't have, APC doesn't have, but other ministries are addressing that. You know, so people with those problems go there and they are ministered to. So like that, I think different ministries can address specific needs and serve the people in the city. I hope I answered your question, Chris. Uh, yes, uh, maybe just a, a follow-up question. Um, um, just from a, just from a sort of a, uh, an analysis point of view, um, yeah. is there a, is there some sort of a, uh, age um, 
you know a profile um, which is more 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 sort of uh, uh, you know is i mean they 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 do desire to look out for you know uh, for this kind of uh, uh, you know um, way of uh, i mean a new way of uh, getting lives and uh, you know getting 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 transformed mm -hmm. now again in generally speaking generally speaking if you if you look at the data uh, uh, children those who give their lives to christ when they are children they are most likely to stay the course uh, they have they have a powerful encounter with god they are most likely to stay the course so if you look at data from i think from child evangelism fellowship cef and so on they put out this data and they show that those whose lives have been touched while they are children powerfully they will you know they are the ones who can who will stay the course uh, in, in, in their life of faith. So children are a great, um, we must reach them. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't put effort in other areas. We need to reach people across all age groups. Um, but definitely you know, looking at that data that comes, uh, ministering to children is, is, is a big thing. And if you can touch them, that's great. Right? Um, in the early age. Um, 14 and so they call it, I think, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, 13 to 17 window or something like that, you know, so that age group is very, very, uh, crucial. Yeah. Four to 14. Yeah. Thank you, Rupa. Four to 14 window. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I just want you to start thinking about this in, in the areas where you are working, you're doing ministry, and uh, uh, we will talk a little bit later on how to develop ministries, but I can say this, that uh, in, in our own journey, uh, we've seen that, you know, if when we are aware of what the needs are in the city, it really helps give us direction on the kinds of ministries we should be doing and the ways in which we should be reaching people in the city, right? If we are blind to it, we don't know what the needs of the people are, then you know we just kind of be groping in the dark, uh, just randomly doing things, and we may not be actually connecting with the people uh, whom we are trying to reach. So it always uh, pays a lot to you know be aware, uh, and also to keep in touch because things are changing in the city very rapidly. You know, the way the dynamics in the city are changing, and so we need to constantly adapt uh, our methods of ministry to be able to reach the people in the city. So that's why the natural dynamics of the city are important, okay? So I will pause here. Uh, in our next class, we talk about the spiritual dynamics, which is also equally important for us to be aware of what's going on spiritually over the city, then we can begin to address from that perspective also as we do ministry in the city. Right? Uh, we are going to close here and um, I'll just uh, request somebody to please pray and dismiss the class, please. Can I pray, Pastor? Go ahead, Elisha. Uh, Heavenly Father, once again, we are most grateful for your goodness, your grace, and your mercies. Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be guided, O oh God, once again, and to be taught about missions, church planting in urban cities. Father, we pray that whatever that we have discussed or we have learned of this course, may it be part of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray that in our various cities, Lord, cause us to influence and make an impact in whatever purpose that you have called us into our various cities. Father, let me cause us to fulfill it in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray that you grant us the great grace and the special grace to be able to influence our communities for you, Jesus. We thank you and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being part of the class.
Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, best.